Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kiriam. Today, we will start our study through the book of Ephesians. If you miss any of our past teachings, you can always go to our website. It is kuim.org or you can go to our SoundCloud or our YouTube channel. It is Simple Truth Gospel with Kiriam. And every teaching, all our teachings are posted online. Before we get started, let's have a word of prayer together. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for another opportunity to gather tonight to study your word. Father, I ask you for the utterance to be able to speak boldly to your people today as your own oracle. Father, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will open the eyes of our understanding you will give us revelation knowledge. You will open your word up to us. Dear Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you will open the eyes, the ears, the heart of each and everyone listening. That you will unveil the truth of the word of God to our hearts tonight. That you will help us to be not just hearers, but also doers of the word of God. Father God, I thank you because you have given us all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray that you will help us to acknowledge the unsearchable riches that are available to us in Christ Jesus and become partakers of these riches because they belong to us now, not in sweet by and by. For everything you've done in the past, what you're doing right now, and the things that you will do in the future, I take no glory, but I say all oh, glory, honor. Thanksgiving belongs to you forever and ever. And everybody say, Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I welcome you to another teaching. Today, we will start the book of Ephesians. And um, I want to give you a brief background before we get into the book. Uh, the book of Ephesians, that letter was written by Paul. It, was, it is actually one of Paul's prison letters when he, while he was in Rome along with um, Philippians, um, Philemon, Colossians. This letter was uh, delivered by Tychicus, who visited Paul while he was in Rome. Now, Ephesus is the old capital of Asia Minor, and uh, which is now in modern-day Turkey. Ephesus has um, a very large commercial port, and uh, you could call it the financial center of the um, Roman Empire. In Ephesus, you remember one of the uh, seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of uh, Artemis or Temple of Diana is found in Ephesus. Then they had a very big school of philosophy. And uh, uh, this is uh, Ephesus is located along uh, uh, the coast of the Aegean Sea. Paul started this church towards the end of his uh, second missionary journey and the beginning of his third missionary journey. He pastored this church for about three years, and then Timothy, about a year and a half. So Paul is writing this letter to a group of uh, Christians who were ignorant of what they had in Christ Jesus, who were living in spiritual poverty and uh, a spiritual purpose and beggars. So he writes to them, to acknowledge the unsearchable riches that they have in Christ Jesus. And then, not only that they should acknowledge these riches, but they should lay hold of these riches and because they belong to them right now. 
In this letter, you will see the phrase in him, by him, through him, so many times. About 27 times Paul used the phrase in him in this letter, telling us, bringing to awareness the things that we have in Christ Jesus. He will spend the first three chapters talking about the things that belong to us in Christ Jesus. And then he will spend the rest of the, the remaining three chapters talking about how to lay hold of this thing, how to become partakers of these things that belongs to us now, and also how to defend these things from the enemy. So this is just a brief summary. But we're going to go ahead and start and... Um, and uh, uh, I, will, I will read um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. So Paul addresses himself here as an apostle of Jesus Christ, but he says it is by the will of God, not by his, by him, by his own calling. Paul did not call himself into the ministry. He says that uh, it is by the will of God. You can change this statement here, this first verse here, to your name. James, a carpenter by the will of God. Mary, a businesswoman by the will of God. You see, not everyone is called into the ministry. But whatever you are, that is where you are called. Find out what you are called to do. A minister is not the highest calling of God. No, it's not. Find out what God has called you to do. Whether he called you to be a janitor, or a businessman or woman, a professor, a lawyer, a banker, whatever he's called you to do. The most important thing is to recognize that uh, where God calls you, he gives you the grace to excel in that area. You can be a representative of God in, every, in any field that you are called. You can be the light of God in that place. You can use any opportunity that you have to minister to someone to bring men into the kingdom of God. If you are very wealthy in your business, you can use the resources that God has given in your hands to finance the kingdom. To help spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, don't say that I, I am not called into the ministry, therefore, I am not going to do anything. Whatever you are, whatever you do, is where you are called. you got to be the light of the word, the light of God in that place. you got to be someone that will represent God in that place. So... He says that it is by the will of God. Jesus Christ says, let your light shine among men so that men seeing your good works will give glory to the heavenly father who is in heaven. So whatever you are, the most important thing is for you to be faithful in that place and uh, shine for the kingdom of God. For the glory of God, not for your own uh, uh, personal glory. Because when you do that for your personal glory, then you've already received your reward. So I encourage you to find out what God has called you to do. It doesn't have to be in the ministry. The Holy Spirit of God will reveal that to you if you would ask him. And in that place where he's called you to be, be the light to that place. 
be an oasis of love in that place. Be a representative of God through ministering to people, through the way you live, and through financing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, he says, or oh, we are still in verse 1. So verse 1, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. So he speaks to saints in Christ Jesus. You see, that word here, saint, the Greek word is uh, hegeos. It means separated or consecrated unto God. It's not a meaning that we see it in the modern world as one who is perfect. Or certain denomination will say a saint is one who is canonized, someone we pray in their name, someone who's done miracles, someone who is dead. No. Paul writes to, in his writings, he calls people who are alive saints. So, if you're born again, if you're a believer in Christ Jesus, he calls you a saint and also a faithful in one in Christ Jesus. Feel free, you can call me Saint Kyrian if you want to. <laughs> you know, so it, it belongs to every one of us. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 2, it says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, Paul uses a, a, a greeting to unite both the Gentiles and the Jews. You know, the Gentiles will always say, uh, uh, Charis, which means grace or rejoice. That's how they greet. And uh, the Jews will say, Shalom. Arim, which means uh, 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 peace. So, he uses this greeting here to bring together the Jews and the Gentiles together. And uh, another thing we get from here is, it's always in this order when Paul writes grace and peace. Which means, until you understand the grace which we have in Christ Jesus, the grace about our salvation, that it is not about what we do or the works we do. It is a free gift given to us by Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And until we understand this, then we will not have peace of God multiplied in our lives. Because once we understand that it is by grace that we are saved, it's not because of our own works. Then we will have peace. Peace of God will abound in our lives. So you will see him always use this in the same order. In verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Jesus. So you see, in our lives as Christians, many times we focus on our physical blessings. You will see a Christian will make a statement like, thank God with me for the car he's given to me. Oh, bless the Lord with me for the house he's given to me, for my children, for the job he's given to me, for the contract that he's given to me. Good, all of these things, they are from God. And we thank God because of his goodness and mercies endure forever. But here, Paul tells us there is something greater than physical blessings. He calls these ones the spiritual blessings, which are the things we have in Christ Jesus. And uh, the moment we begin to recognize that we have spiritual blessings, then we will do it out. He tells us that is something that we call spiritual bank account, that it belongs to every one of us as a Christian, that we need to tap in there and see how much is available in there. And then we draw from this account, oh, even for a better and a successful life as Christians. So he tells us that uh, about these spiritual blessings. 
And he's going to go in now and tell us about these spiritual blessings. But first of all, he's bringing it to awareness that we have spiritual blessings, not only physical blessings. As a matter of fact, spiritual blessings supersedes physical blessings. Now, he's going to let us in now on these spiritual blessings. And there are so many of them. Some people see about six in this chapter one that we're going to cover today. Some people see seven. But oh, we're just going to study and then we will find out what we will find out. It doesn't matter how many there are, but we the purpose is for us to be aware that these things belong to us, and then we take hold of them. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 4, it says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. So in this already, I see two spiritual blessings. The very first one is that God chose us before the foundation of the earth. And the second one is we are now accepted in the beloved. So we take them one after the other. He says, before the foundation of the earth, God chose us. Which means he wrote our names in the book of life or the book of Lamb. And someone will say, how is this possible that God, he chose us before the foundation of the earth? And then when we read other uh, verses in the Bible, he says, it is our own choice to receive Jesus Christ or not. God say, gave us his only begotten son that whosoever believe should not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever believe, which means it is my own choice to believe or not to believe. So how is it then possible that God has chosen me before the foundation of the earth? But someone will say, which one is it then? So here he's talking about divine election and human volition. Which one is it? The answer is both. And we're going to go through the scripture so that you will understand it. Now, God chose us before the foundation of the earth for the simple reason that he is omniscient. He has foreknowledge. He knows everything. So, before he created the word, because of his foreknowledge, he knew those who would hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and make that uh, human volition, human choice to receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Based on this foreknowledge, he writes their name in the book of Lamb. So let's go through scriptures telling us that God has foreknowledge, which means he knows everything before. You see, God is not limited in time. We are the ones who live in this earth, so we got to go by time, by seasons. We will go from 2022 to 2023. But God, from eternity past, unto the future eternity, he has no beginning, he has no end, so he sees everything the same. He doesn't have to wait for one year to see what's going to happen next year. He sees it all. So God has foreknowledge. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I separated you and ordained you a prophet to the nation. He's telling Jeremiah this. So he knew about Jeremiah even before Jeremiah was born. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, he says, For whom? He foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the first fruit among many brethren. So those he foreknew, he predestinated. Because he foreknew them, this is the reason why he was able to predestinate them. God's foreknowledge. Are you catching what I'm saying? 
in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, we're going to cover that the next time, but in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has ordained that we should walk in them. He ordained that we should walk in them. So God, he already, he knew those who would come to him. He recreated us in Christ Jesus unto good works. But he ordained these good works way before we were created. Good means he knew we were going to come into these good works based on his own foreknowledge. Now, let me read to you one more scripture. Uh, and this is from Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10. It says, Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So he declares the end from the beginning. He sees it all. So are you going to be troubled about God knowing that you will receive Jesus Christ and he wrote your name before the foundation of the earth? Should that be a problem to you? Are you not aware that he is God and I am not and you are not and we are just his own creature? <laughs> Why would that be a problem unto you? Because I see so many Christians struggling this uh, divine election and human volition doctrine. <laughs> we should not. Rather, Bible says, believe. He, don't, he didn't say understand everything. He said, believe. <laughs> And once you know that you got just to believe, so many problems is going to be solved. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we proceed, now I'm going to talk about why, I'm going to talk about human volition, which means our choice. How is it possible that we are able to make choices? It is so because God created us as free mortal agents with free mortal rights. For the same reason that Adam was able to fall, God could have stopped Adam from eating that tree, that fruit, that day. He could have. He is God. But he gave him that uh, free choice. And God will not, violate, will not violate his word. The same reason that Lucifer was able to fall and became Satan. God could have stopped him from rebelling against him. He created him in the first place. But God will never stop anyone from making their own choices. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. If you don't have that choice, how are you going to choose? Jesus Christ says in Revelation chapter 3, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, he says, I will come in and I will eat with that one. He will eat with me. Which means he knocks at the door, but you are the one who's going to make the choice of opening that door. If you will confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Now, if you would confess, is a thing of choice. If you would believe in your heart, is a thing of choice. Is not a must. It is a decision that you got to make. Whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, the Bible tells us. So you are the one who will call upon the name of the Lord. So it is a choice that you got to make. Now, as beautiful as it is, Jesus Christ put these two doctrines, human volition and, uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, divine election. He puts them in one verse. And this we found it in John chapter 6, 6 verse 37. It says, all that the Father gives to me shall come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no wise cast out. So you see that all that the Father gives to me, divine election. He says, anyone that comes to me, I will by no wise cast out, which is your own choice. Human volition or human choice. So it is settled by the word of God. 
So don't say that I, I am not chosen. My name is not written in the book of Lamb. How do I know? And then you do nothing. Make a move. Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And you will find that the moment you do, that your name has been written in the book of life from the foundation of the earth. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you as excited your name is written in the Lamb's book of life? That you're going to spend eternity with Jesus Christ of Nazareth in his own presence forever? Are you not excited? Are you not happy? I am. I'm about to get up from this place and do a little bit spin here and run a little bit and come back. Oh, it is something of joy. Whenever you remember this, it should be, it should fill your heart with joy. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we are in verse 7. In him, you see again, pay attention, I told you that he used the word in him, in this letter, about 27 times. So in him, he's telling you about the things we have in Christ Jesus, the spiritual blessings. Remember, that's what we are covering now. Those things we have in Christ Jesus, because we are children of God, because we are born again. So in verse 7, it says, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence. So I see another one here, redemption. Remember, the word redemption is an ancient uh, 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 term. They use it a lot, which, um, which you, the, most of the time they use it to represent buying back a slave from the slave block and giving that slave their own freedom. So someone is sold as slave because they owe some money. They were not able to pay up. So they were going to work out, you know, whatever they owe uh, 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 in, in works, in labor for years. But then someone comes and asks the master, how much this guy owes you? And he says, so, 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 he owes, he owes me. And then he counts all the money and say, here is what he owes you. I want you to give him his own freedom. That is the concept of redemption. So he says, in Christ Jesus, we have redemption through his own blood. Before you were born again, you were under the custody of Satan. You were alienated from the commonwealth, from the things of God. You were separated from him because that's what we call spiritual death. We could not be united to God. We belong to Satan because of what Adam and Eve did. We were born that way naturally. But Jesus Christ came through his precious blood. The sacrifice he did at the cross, his vicarious atonement, he said, I'm going to buy you back from this one who is your master, Satan. I'm going to pay whatever you owe him. And this time around, he uses his own blood, his own precious blood. And he pays it all in full, in completeness, without any reservation. Remember in the Old Testament, they only offered sacrifices. And these sacrifices would only cover their sins for just one year. On Yom Kippur which is on the 10th day of Tishri, the day of atonement, the high priest will get into the Holy of Holies with the blood of animal. And he will make that sacrifice on, on that mercy seat. He will sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, which will cover their sins for just one day. And now he tells us, 
which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom in and prudence. So now Jesus Christ came and took it one step further. He made it to abound by doing it once and for all. He entered into the holy of holies with his own precious blood. Now we don't have to do that anymore every year. So he did it once and for all. So the redemption he gave to us abounded by him sacrificing his own self, by him giving us, shedding his own blood. So we are redeemed. We are saved now from what we were in before he came. Remember the Bible says that Satan is the God of this world and the whole universe lies under his own influence. So if you are not yet born again, this is still true. But once you get born again, now redemption comes to you. Jesus Christ paid it all. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we get to verse 9. He says, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. He talks about the mystery here. The mystery was hidden from the Old Testament. He says, having made known to us the mystery of his will. But this mystery, what is this mystery? What is this mystery? This mystery is that there is not going to be any more war, barrier, separating the Jews from the Gentiles. You see, the prophets of old, they prophesied about these things, but they did not understand it. Bible said they wanted to look, they wished to look into these things. These things they prophesied. They didn't understand it. Jesus Christ came in his ministry. He gave us he, he, he gave us revelation of this, ministry, of this mystery. He began to explain this mystery to us. And then the apostles after him, especially Paul, the apostle, explained this mystery to us. The mystery that the Jews and the Gentiles will become one body in Christ Jesus. And one day, Jesus Christ is going to rule but the Gentiles and the Jews together from Jerusalem during the millennium age. Remember in, in, in Revelation, the Bible tells us, when the seventh angel sounded the trumpet, he says voices were heard in heaven and they said, the kingdoms of this earth have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. So there will be a day when all will be brought together in one. And Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the king, oh, one king, will rule from Jerusalem. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he wants us to be conscious about this. He will come. He will come. He will not tarry. Someday it will happen and you and I will be there. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, we are in verse 11. He says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That he, we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Here again, he used the word again in him. So he's about to tell you another spiritual blessing. And that spiritual blessing that he tells us here is inheritance. What we have in Christ Jesus. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember... Jesus Christ is the heir of all things. Everything. God created everything for Jesus Christ. He created them. The Bible tells us in Romans. Romans chapter 8. 
verse 16. He says, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Oh, glory, hallelujah. He's telling you here that uh, because of the inheritance we have in Him, everything Jesus Christ owes now belongs to us. Everything He owns belongs to us. He says we are joint heirs now with Christ Jesus. Everything that belongs to Jesus Christ belongs to you and I. <laughs> are you hearing that? If everything that Jesus Christ owes belongs to you, what are you going to spend your time worrying? Where are you going to spend your time in anxiety? Where are you going to spend your time living in doubt and in faithlessness? Remember, he owns everything. All things were made for him. So now they belong to him. Now they belong to us. Are you hearing that? In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21, he says, Let no man glory in any man, for all things are yours. He says, Whether Paul, or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death. He says, Of the things present, or the things that are yet to come, he says, all things are yours. How are all things, are, how are they yours? In Christ Jesus. Remember, do not forget this phrase. It is in Christ Jesus. That we, these spiritual blessings belong to us. These unsearchable riches of Christ belong to us. In Christ Jesus. So, remember that always. All things are yours. Spiritual blessings, they belong to us. That bank account is big. <laughs> that spiritual bank account is huge. <laughs> you cannot exhaust it. Regardless of how much you want to spend, regardless of how uh, uh, expensive you are, when it comes to spiritual spending, you cannot be able to exhaust it. It's impossible. So why don't you go in and start spending today? These things belong to us in Christ Jesus. Don't wait in sweet by and by. Don't wait till we get to heaven. It is yours now. It is yours. It is mine right now in the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory, hallelujah, amen. Thank you, Jesus. And it tells us that our trusting in Jesus Christ gives praise to God. That's what the Father wants us to do, to trust in his own son. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 13, he says, in him again. You see that phrase again, in him. You also trusted after you had the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory? Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now he's trying to he's talking to you now about the Holy Spirit. So let me take you a little bit. Let me remind you a little bit what happens when you get born again. When anyone gets born again, let me tell you what happens. They hear the gospel. Someone preached the gospel to them. Or it could be through a medium that they had the gospel. Then the Holy Spirit of God will convict them, telling them, you need Jesus Christ. He is the only way. Receive him today and you have your ticket to eternity. The Holy Spirit makes the conviction. And then you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And the moment you do, the Holy Spirit will recreate your spirit. 
and then he will baptize you into the body of Christ. For by one spirit are we baptized into the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. So now, he moves in, in you. Now the Holy Spirit of God now lives in you. So he's telling us here that the Spirit of God that moved in you the day you got born again is a symbol, a sign of ownership. That you are now owned by God. Not only that is a sign of God's ownership, it is also a down payment. Jesus Christ has purchased you, for you are bought with a price, Bible tells us. He says, now glorify God in your life and in your spirit, which are God's. So now, you are now purchased with a price. But, you have not been fully redeemed. But remember when you're going to buy a house, sometimes or most of the time or all the time, depending on where you live, they're going to require you to put down a deposit or what they call earnest money. Just to prove that you are interested in buying that property. And to show that you put down something, more is coming. So it tells us that the Holy Spirit is there down payment which God has made, telling us that is more coming. More will be coming. Our glorified body will be coming. Our spending eternity in heaven will be coming. Those things are not yet fully redeemed. But the Holy Spirit that is in us now is the down payment which God has made to tell us that we are now his own property. He has purchased us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 15, he says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for the saints. I'm going to stop here and then explain a little bit. Paul begins to pray for the church at Ephesus. But he says, therefore, I also, after I heard of your love in the Lord Jesus and your love for, the, for all the saints. Paul heard about something. A progress. Spiritual progress that this church were making. This church was making. And... Uh, he talked about this spiritual progress here. He said, the faith which they have in God, number one. Number two, the love they have for all the saints. So he acknowledges their spiritual progress. And he began to pray to God, began, he began to give, give thanks to God for this progress that they're making. Paul was not praying and thanking God, maybe because of the new building which they acquired, or because of the population growth of the congregation. No, he, wasn't, he, he didn't say that. But he emphasized about uh, the importance of uh, spiritual progress in the church. You see, this is a very important lesson for us to learn. For us, members of the church, and for ministers, those who teach the word of God. So I'm going to ask you this question. Where do you go to church? Do you go to church in a place whereby the minister is caught up in liberalism and in modernism? Or in a place where human dogmas and, uh, and, and, and the doctrines are taught for the sound doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ? Do you go to a place where the minister does not teach the word of God? 
where we have uh, a bunch of uh, spiritual babies. Where the minister prefers to teach uh, denominational rituals and traditions rather than to feed the people with the word of God. Do you go to a place where there is division, where there is strife and contention? Or do you go to a place where there is love, love for God and love for one another? Ask yourself this question. Spiritual growth is very, very important in every church. And it is our own responsibility as members of these churches to double check what the ministers are teaching. Be like the Borean church. Paul recommended them. He said, when they went home, they searched out the scriptures just to see if those things were so. He recommended them. Compare them with the church at Thessalonica. Find out what the minister is teaching. There is a reason why we have the word of God with us. It's not a hidden thing. Everybody should have a Bible. Look and see what they're teaching. What they're telling you. Do they correspond with the word of God? Or are they teaching you human dogmas and doctrines? Which Jesus Christ says make the word of God of no effect. What are they teaching you? If you belong to a church that you don't grow, where you don't have any spiritual progress, what are you still doing there? Find out a place where you can be fed the word of God and then you can grow and also help people around you to grow. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can see how important this thing is because after 35 years, about 35 years, that Paul prayed this prayer for the church at Ephesus. Jesus Christ wrote them a postcard through John in Revelation. And he tells them, I know your works and I know your labor. I know your patience. How you don't like evil. How you have tested people who say that they were apostles and you found them as liars and he says to them but i have this against you you have left your first love and he talks to them he says remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works Otherwise, I will come quickly and I will remove your candlesticks if you don't repent. So you can see that this church here stopped making spiritual progress. Because Jesus Christ has to write to them and correct them. So in any church where they stop making spiritual progress, that church is on its way to decay. Find out where you go. Are you making spiritual progress? Jesus Christ warns this church that he's going to come very quickly and remove their candlesticks. He's talking to you and I. He's talking to the ministers. These ministers that are parading themselves with all kinds of dogmas and doctrines. Things that are contrary to the word of God. He says, if you don't repent, if you don't feed my sheep, if you don't give them the word of God, I'm going to come quickly and your candlesticks will be removed. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's see what Paul prayed for this church. In verse 16, he prays. Do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. What a wonderful prayer. 
Paul prays to them that uh, through the Holy Spirit of God, they will have revelation, knowledge of God, which means that they will understand the scriptures. That they will, they, that the, the things in the word of God will be revealed to them. Now, the Holy Spirit is the only one who can do this. Now, remember that the, the, the word of God was written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Men of old wrote as they were inspired by the Spirit of God. Unless the Holy Spirit of God opens the mind of your understanding, unless the Holy Spirit of God gives you revelation of the Word of God, you will not understand it. It will just be to you like any other book. Paul knows the importance of this and he prays this prayer for them that God will give them revelation knowledge of him through the scriptures, through the understanding of the scriptures. Now, remember there is a, a right knowledge of God and the wrong knowledge of God. Paul tells us this in Romans chapter 10, verse 2, all the way to verse 4. When he says, brethren, my heart desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them record that they have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they have been ignorant of the righteousness of God and going about establishing themselves, establishing their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to anyone who believes. So you can have a zeal, but that zeal is not according to knowledge. You can have the knowledge of human doctrine, human, uh, human traditions, human rituals. There is not the knowledge of God. And you can waste so many time. You can waste a lot of time. You can waste a lot of time just involving yourself with things that are not the word of God. In Hosea 4, 6, the Bible says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Knowledge of the word of God. Knowledge of God himself. The entrance of his word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. When we get the word of God in us, he gives us light. And he gives us understanding. Jesus Christ says, you err not understanding the scriptures, nor the power of God. This is where the, that's where the problem lies. You search the scriptures. Because you think in them you have eternal life. But there are there that bear witness of me. But you will not come to me that you will have life. Wrong. They search it wrongly. Wrongfully. They are not searching the right way. So he says. I am the one you're supposed to search. When you search. I am the one you're supposed to find. But I am surprised that you are finding other things. So when we read the word of God, when we engage ourselves in Bible studies, in going to church, churches, what are we actually learning? Are we learning the word of God? Are we receiving revelation knowledge of the gospel of the word of God? Or are we completely studying something different from the word of God? That's how important it is. And Paul prays this prayer for the church at Ephesus. In verse 18, he says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance, in the saints. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says here, 
He prays for the eyes of the understanding to be enlightened. In other words, the eyes of the spirit to be, on, to be enlightened so that they will know, they will understand the things that wait for them after this life. The riches of his glory. The things that laid up for us in heaven. He said that they will have a clue. That it does not end here in this world. That there is something bubbling over there. Paul says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this world cannot be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. There is such a glory that is coming. So he tells them, he prays that they will have an understanding. That the eyes of the spirit will be enlightened. That they will have a glimpse of this up oncoming glory. This upcoming glory. This glory that will be revealed in us. Oh, at the end of this world. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he did not stop there. He also prays that they will acknowledge that we are treasures to God. That God values us so much. That he gave his only begotten son for us. Remember the parable when Jesus Christ talked about the man who found a treasure in a field. And he hid the treasure. He went and he sold everything he got. He came and he purchased the field so that he will unveil the treasure in this field. This is what God did for us. If it was only Adam and Eve who were supposed to be redeemed, God would have done the same thing he did for everyone. Jesus Christ died not only for our own sins, but for the sins of the whole world. So this is how much God values us. We are like treasures unto him. He wants us to understand this. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 19, he says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he walked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, and power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is Paul, what is he talking about here? He wants us also to acknowledge another spiritual blessings here. The acknowledgement of for the power we have in us. You see, Paul wrote this letter to a group of Christians. He wrote it to them, but he's talking to us today. Who were ignorant of the things that they have in Christ Jesus. Who were living their lives as paupers, as beggars. Even though they have a big spiritual account laid up for them. But they were on the way, so they couldn't take advantage of it. So he tells them, and he's telling us today. So he now he talks, he talks about the power. He says, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. He says, the same power lives in us today. He tells us the power is now within, not outside. Where are you looking, my friends? Are you looking outside or are you looking within? Now he's talking about the power of the Holy Ghost. That's what he's talking about here. Remember the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. But in Romans chapter 8 verses 11, he tells us who the glory of the Father is. He says, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, him that raised up Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit. That dwells in you. So we know now that it is the Holy Spirit of God that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead. So he says, the same spirit dwells in you now. Are you looking for the power outside of you? 
he tells you that the same power is now resident in you. In Mark chapter 16, Jesus Christ says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they will cast out devils. They will speak with other tongues. And if you read for it, it says, They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. He's talking about the power. In the name of Jesus. The power of the Holy Ghost. He says, In my name, by the power of the Spirit, you will do all these things. You will cast out devils. Now, do not pray to God and beg God to make Satan go away, make Satan take his hands off your business or the things that pertains to you. It is a wrong way to pray. Why is it the wrong way to pray? Because God has given you the authority in his name by the power of his spirit to cast out devils. You deal with him. Remember that the Father God and Jesus Christ has done everything they will do about Satan. Until that day when that angel will bind him and cast him into a bushel. Until then, the power is in you. Remember, I'm not telling you to go over there and start doing these things on your own natural ability. You are not matched for Satan when it comes to natural ability. But I'm telling you in the name of Jesus. That's what Paul is saying here. He said the same power that raised up Jesus Christ. He says that power is in you now. The same power that Jesus Christ operated with when he had his ministry here on earth. He says the same power is in you now. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ operated with only the power of the Holy Ghost. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. Who went about doing good. Jesus tells you. He says the same power that I operated when I was here on the earth, is in you now. If it is not so, the Bible would not have said, resist the devil and he will flee from you. If it is not so, the Bible would not have said, give no place to the devil. If it is not so, the Bible would not have said, who resists self steadfast in your faith. But it is so. That's why he tells you to do so. Now, you can live a successful, victorious life here on earth when you acknowledge that the power of the Holy Ghost is in you. Now, I'm not telling you that you're going to live here on this earth without any tribulation or any trials or any difficulties. That's not what I'm saying. As long as you live here on the earth. Because the rain will rain on the righteous and also on the wicked. The sun will shine on the righteous and also on the wicked. So being a Christian doesn't give you the immunity to be out of troubles or tribulations or trials. It's not an immunity. But the difference is this. However they come, whenever they come, how long they choose to stay. He tells you that in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Ghost, you're going to be more than a conqueror. Which means you're going to be an overcomer. You're going to prevail. You will not be hemmed in or cast down. So it tells you to recognize the power that is in you now. This power cannot be found elsewhere. It is inside you. So the moment you recognize, remember the purpose of this letter, telling the Christians to know what belongs to them and tap into these unsearchable riches. So they are no longer being cast down by the plot of this earth. By the, by the evils of the enemy. He says, don't let this happen anymore. When they come to you, put them under your feet. That's where they belong. And we're going to see that now in a minute. Now, if we proceed further here. In verse 22, he says, And he put all things under his feet. And gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fits all in all. So not only that Father God has put all things under the feet of Jesus Christ, he also gave us Jesus. 
He gave the church Jesus. Not only that he gave only he gave us Jesus, but he also gave us his name, the name of Jesus. And we know about the name of Jesus. God have highly exalted him, the Bible said, and is giving him the name above all names. That at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee must bow of beings in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue must confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now you see that all things are under your feet. For the simple reason that you are in Christ. That Christ is the head of the church and we are members of his own body. The awareness, the recognition, the consciousness of these things that belong to us in Christ Jesus is the purpose of this letter. And my good friends, I want you to meditate upon these spiritual blessings. They are, they belong to us. Right now, you can have one million dollars sitting in a bank account under your name. But if you don't go to the bank and you are not aware that that money is sitting there, it's going to be useless to you. You can live in lack and in poverty and in distress and in depression. Having one million dollars sitting in the bank for you. But the moment you realize that I have one million dollars in the bank, they are sitting for me, now you can solve your problems. You can go and withdraw and buy a house and buy a car and do the things that you want to do with the money. You see, this is what Paul is bringing to our own consciousness to recognize that we have a spiritual bank account. And he says, go in there now and tap in. For they belong to you here right now, not in sweet by and by. Good friends of mine, I've come to the end of today's teaching. If you under the sound of my voice, and you are not yet a Christian. Now, a Christian means someone who depends on Jesus Christ 100%. Who believe that Jesus Christ died for his own sins. And God raised him from the dead on the third day. And then you ask him to come into your life. And become your Lord and your Savior. Which means you surrender to him. And you begin a relationship with him. Remember, just believing in Jesus Christ does not give you salvation. Are you hearing me? James says, you say you believe in Christ. You do well. He says, even demons believe and they tremble. Demons believe in Jesus Christ, but are they saved? No, they are not, they are not saved because they don't want to have any relationship with him. So, you're going to have that relationship with him. The relationship of a master and a servant. A lord and a savior. And then you stay away from your own works. Because your works cannot give you salvation. You cannot purchase salvation with a price. It is a free gift. God gave us that gift through Jesus Christ, dying at the cross for our sins. All you got to do is to believe in him. Have the relationship with him and this salvation is yours. It is only by Jesus Christ that it is possible. That is why the Bible tells us in John chapter 14 verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But the name of Jesus, Peter tells us in Acts of the Apostles. So, do not say that all roads lead to heaven. That is not true. In case if you belong to another religion and you say, yeah, we have the same father. The only difference is the way we approach him. The Bible tells us it is not so. 
He says, if you reject Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you will not have the Father God. Only when you have Jesus that you can have the Father. So what are you waiting for? Bible says, the day you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart right now, even as I speak. All you got to do is to open the door and let him in. It is not by force. He created us as free mortal agents. We got to make the decision. No one is going to make it for us. But you see, we got to make it while we are still alive. Once our spirit leaves our body, it becomes too late. So, you want to make the decision when you have the time. At the right time, which is now. Don't say, let me go get my acts together. There are so many things I'm doing wrong. I want to get them in order before I can come receive Jesus. You could not get yourself in order. Why? Because you have a sinful nature. You don't have the ability. He cannot do it except the power of the Holy Ghost in you will give you that strength to do it. But Jesus Christ wants you to come as you are. Come in as you are. This is the reason why he died for our sins. And once you come in, he's not going to leave you the way that you came in. He's going to recreate your spirit and now give you the, 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 the ability to be able now to live a life worthy of emulation. My good friends, he that believes not is already condemned, the Bible says. Saying that he does not believe in the only begotten Son, the name of the only begotten Son of God. That is the reason why you are condemned. In the world today, about 155,000 people died just in the world. One day, where did they go? It depends on the choice they made when they were still alive. If they chose Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they would go up in heaven and they would spend eternity with God. But if they did not choose Jesus, if they rejected him, they're going to spend eternity in hell. Hell is a place, is a real place. And I want to warn you about hell so you don't go there. It is a place of torture, a place of darkness where people will be gnashing their teeth for eternity. Jesus says, don't go there. When you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Receive him today as your Lord and your Savior. He says, if you believe not that I am the Son of God, that I am the Messiah, he says, you will die in your own sin. But why would you die? Why will you die? The Bible says, turn around. Turn around. He says, why would you perish? God says, I delight not in the death of the sinner. It does not make him happy. So I'm going to lead you now in a very short prayer. If you pray this prayer and you mean it with your heart, you're going to be born again right now. And if you would die right now, you will be in heaven with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Pray this prayer with me. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I believe he is your son, that he died for my sins. You raised him up from the dead on the third day. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, come into my life today and be my Lord and my Savior. I believe that I am now born again. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life and my sins are washed away. Father God, I give you all the glory in the name of Jesus. Congratulations if you prayed that prayer. Welcome into the kingdom of God. Now, there is a subsequent experience. We call it the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And it is, after you get born again, the empowerment of the Holy Ghost for you to live that Christian life that God has called you to live. If you want to know more about this experience, go to my iCarve on YouTube, Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. And there is a teaching there titled 
speaking in tongues is for every believer. It will help you, it will guide you, it will teach you all you need to know about this experience. Now, remember that you were a baby Christian because you just got born again. So find a good church where they teach the word of God. Buy a Bible so that you can study the word of God. Remember, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That is the only way you can grow in your faith. It will come through the word of God. Peter says, desire the sincere milk of the word of God that you may grow thereby. I want to use this opportunity to thank all our partners all over the world. Those who are helping us through their services, through their prayers, through their financial assistance. To reach other people for Christ at no cost to them. If you would like to become our partner, please go to our website. It is KUIM.org. There will be a donation button where you can securely give your donations to help us even reach more people for the kingdom of God. Remember, it's only those who hear the word of God and they do the word of God. They are the ones who get the benefits of the word of God. Friends, I pray for you today. May the Lord bless you and be with you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, give you prosperity, and give you divine health and spiritual growth and bless your week in Jesus' name. Amen. Surely there is an end and your expectations will never be cut off. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. O Baruch Hashem Adonai. Kandabosko, Bele Beste. Is gora gasko da pro oske dis kara antala. Antala nama englendem jeribroskute elafadisko busko bushke talapa enkele isko pusko. And